everyone, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to uh, Making Grades Matter in the Digital World. My name is Matt Townsley. I am the Director of Instruction and Technology in the Solon Community School District. If you're not familiar with Solon, it is a, a smaller 3A school in Iowa, about halfway between Cedar Rapids and Iowa City. We're a growing school district. Um, about anywhere from uh, 110 to 140 kids per graduating class. Um, this is my sixth year as a district administrator. Prior to that, I was a high school math teacher at Solon High School for six years as well. And how many of you ever go to a conference, an educational conference, and you think, man, if I can just go away with one thing, I will be happy. Raise your hand, just one thing. Awesome, that's great. Um, I went to a conference and I took away one huge thing huge thing about eight years ago. I was at the uh, State Math Teachers Conference, at, um, ICTM, Iowa Council of Teachers Mathematics Conference, and I had this decision to make. Should I go to lunch early, or should I go to one more session and eat a late lunch? And the uh, session was led by the name of Lynn Selking. She's now a math consultant at Great Prairie AEA. She was a math teacher at the time. It was something about uh, broken grade books or something like that. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of interesting. And so I decided to eat late, eat a late lunch that day at the ICTM conference. And I am so glad that I did because I took home this huge, just mind-boggling change that just made so much sense to me in the classroom. I remember going home and talking to my high school principal, Bob Latton, and said, Bob, here's what I'm thinking. I want to make this change. I want to make this change like a couple weeks from now, beginning of the fourth quarter. What do you think? And he looked at me and he said, Matt, I believe everything that you just said. I want you to try it out. And I thought, well, that was kind of easy. I guess I'll just try it out then. And I did. And uh, as it turns out, um, I started doing this thing called standards-based grading in my high school math classroom. As it turns out, elementary teachers have been doing this for like lots and lots of years, way before my time, and that was OK. Um, and I was talking to a uh, person that taught next door to me. He was um, in his second year of teaching, or first year, I'm not sure which time. And um, literally, out, out in the parking lot one day, he was about ready to quit teaching. He was just so frustrated and thought, I'm just, I'm just not going to come back. This isn't for me. He had a conversation about, you know, why do you give grades? You know, what, what's the purpose of an A in your class? What do you, what's, what's a quiz? What's a test? What's the purpose of homework? And we just had a kind of informal conversation, and I shared with him what I was doing, and he said, I want to do that too. And then more teachers started jumping on board. Um, a few years later, I moved to the district office. I had really no intention of trying to make some systematic change across the entire district. Um, but the stars were aligned, and you'll hear more of our story here of how we've changed from a system that rewards kids for um, turning in homework for points, bringing in Kleenex boxes for points, to a system that rewards kids for learning stuff. And if you're interested in checking out these slides, they are available, www.mctownsley.net slash resources. Um, that little link will be in the lower right-hand corner of some of the slides later, so if you decide to jump in a little bit later, you're welcome to do that. Also, I encourage you, um, on the iTech site, with all the other like session resources, there's a link that you can go to, and you can click through, and there's a Google document that's been created already. If you'd like to type in your notes and create some collaborative, collaborative notes throughout the room, you're welcome to do that as well. So uh, again, go to the iTech conference site, click on session resources, and you should see that in this specific session. So um, a little time for you to think, and then I'm going to ask you to share with someone in just a moment. In what class in your teacher ed program did you learn about grading, tests, quizzes, projects, papers, and oral presentations? In what class? in your teacher ed program. For some of you, it was just last year. For some of you, it was quite some time ago. I'm going to ask you to try to recall um, what class was that. Give me just a few seconds here to think. And then I'm going to ask you to turn to someone around you and share with them your thoughts. All right, go ahead and share. We'll go for just about uh, 30 seconds here. We'll come back to large groups and make it quick. Go ahead. Ladies, what you got?
Okay, I was talking to some folks up here and they said, oh, we remember the class, not sure the name of it, but we learned how to create rubrics. Anyone have that class? The rubric class? Uh, maybe like you took like a, like a psych tests and measures type class, maybe you learned like construct validity and how to write a good multiple choice test and all that. Um, but did they ever tell you like, oh, you should make every word problem worth five points? Or you should make every essay worth 100 points? Where did we learn that from? Well, chances are most of us had like a practicum experience or a student teacher or something like that. We just kind of went, okay, that makes sense. I think I'll start doing that too. Um, so I think another opportunity for us to talk here, and I hope you're getting kind of this idea, we're going to do a little bit of uh, sharing here, is I want you to think right now for a second, what does a B mean at the top of a student's language arts test? In other words, if your kid brought home a B, or you issued a B, what does that mean about the test, or what's that mean about the kid? Okay. Secondly, what does, if you saw this like in Power School, James, here at the campus, or whatever, if a kid got an A on the book trailer project using iMovie. What does an A on that mean? Okay, so think for just a second. I'm going to set the timer this time for a minute and 30 seconds. I think we'll be a little bit more conversation this time. Again, pull up the chair next to one. Don't be afraid to uh, discuss with them. Go ahead. interested in the, uh, the book trailer one. Because some of you are saying, oh, if they got an A on that, it means they know really a lot how to use iMovie or whatever program that is. They know how to create good transitions, good background music. They followed the checklist you created in that rubric class we learned in college. You know what I'm saying? They had exactly five images and they cited the source or they used them from iClipart.com, right? Right? And they had, you know, the instruction says it had to have been 5 minutes and 30 seconds or less. If it's 5 minutes and 35 seconds, we take off 5 points because it's 5 seconds over. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Is the, it, it, when we do things that way, how much of the grade is about their ability to use iMovie? It, by the way, is the class called iMovie 9 or is it English 9? You hear where I'm going with that? We expect, I mean, I think, I think we expect that if a kid gets an A in a class or a content area, that I think our parents expect that means that they know something. Again, I was a former high school math teacher, and I tell you what, here is a bad, bad habit of high school math teachers. You get kids that come in unprepared for the first high school math class, and who do you blame it on? Those middle school math teachers. 
teachers, I tell you. They just, if they would do a better job teaching, we'd have kids that, and of course that's not true, but, oh, why is it that a kid gets an A in eighth grade math and they come to us and they know nothing about math? Well, partly it's because we did a lot of things like if you turn in this homework assignment, you get five points. Right? It's practice, so we don't want to grade it on how well you understand it, so we'll just give you five points for doing it and showing your work. Okay? And so um, we could talk for a long time about what a B means on a language arts test. For some of you, it means it would be low understanding. Some of you might be, they actually had an A on the test, but they didn't, they were absent the day they took the test, and they didn't come in the day they were supposed to make it up, and so you took off 10%. Because they didn't come back in the day, make it up the day they're supposed to. And so, really, a B on the language arts test could actually mean they know everything there is to know about that particular thing in language arts. And so, the point here is that grades really have a very foggy interpretation. A very foggy interpretation. Tom Gusky and one of his colleagues said very well often in grading, we continue to use old practices and policies not because of their proven merit but simply because we've always done it that way and we've never asked why. I hope that during the next 15 minutes or now about 45 or so that you'll begin to ask why and take away a few solutions or perhaps things you can interpret in your, and implement in your classroom uh, to try to take away some of that ambiguity of grades. Um, before we do that though, I want to talk about a book that's had just a huge impact on me. Um, it's not a new book. Uh, it's by an author by the name of Dan Lordy. And he was a University of Chicago sociologist, education type researcher guy. And basically what Dan Lurie did is he interviewed and, and, and researched a bunch of teachers and just basically said, why do you do what you do? Why do you do these things that you do? Where did, where did that knowledge come from? And the outcome of his research was essentially this. That if you took the typical person that becomes a teacher, right? They go kindergarten, first, second, third, all the way through 12th grade, they graduate high school. And they go to some teacher prep program. It could take them four or five years. Okay? Let's assume that they went to the absolute best teacher prep program in Iowa. I went to Wartburg School, so I went to Wartburg College. Okay? Let's, uh, there's another person who went to Wartburg. Okay, Wartburg. By the way, it's Alpha today. You know that? It's back on campus. Yeah, we can talk about that after. Okay? What's that? I know. All right. So Warburg College, the best teacher prep program in Iowa. And then let's say that they experienced the most innovative and progressive teacher ed program ever through their field experiences. They got placed with the most innovative and progressive field experience people or practical people. And then let's say that they got placed with the most innovative and engaging and awesome student teaching, cooperating teaching. That's a lot of ifs, isn't it? And then they walk into their classroom for the very first time. By the way, is anyone a first year teacher in here? Awesome. I, I love first year teachers. I'm, I'm part of our mentoring induction program. I love the first, the first year teachers. And here's what, we, here's what tends to happen, according to Dan Lordy, with our beginning teachers. They've got all these great ideas. Awesome ideas. They're going to transform the world through teaching. And then at some point in time that first year, we've all been there or we're on their way there. And we're like, holy cow, this teaching thing is kind of hard, isn't it? Really, really hard. Like, I've got to take a lot of stuff home. I'm sacrificing time with my spouse and family just so I can keep up with the day-to-day -day stuff that I was teaching. And at some point in time, I'm going to give up all those innovative and cool things because I just need to survive as a teacher. Some of us are shaking our head, been there, done that. And what do we resort back to? We resort back to, according to Dan Lordy, what he calls the apprenticeship of observation. We experience school a certain way, K through 12, that's 13 years of school. And we're like, well, if they just lectured and gave worksheets back then and it worked for me, it must be okay if I start doing that. It's not a conscious decision, it's a subconscious decision. So the reason I bring this up is because it's no blame, no shame. Sometimes people come away with this feeling like, oh, Matt Towns just attacked me for 15 minutes. I feel like I'm not doing anything well. It's just a no blame, no shame. We all do things because we think we're doing the best job we can. Most of us go into our jobs trying to do awesome things for kids. Sometimes we just don't know there's a different way of doing it. Sometimes we've never been exposed to a different way of doing it. When I went to that math teaching conference eight years ago or so, I didn't know there was a different way of grading. 
And so I hope today that you will try to shed some of that apprenticeship of observation as a result of today and think about ways in which you could potentially uh, do a little bit differently. Okay, so another uh, think pair share. We're going to do a really brief one here. If a student, if you're a secondary teacher, this is a really great exercise. This is fresh on your mind. If you are a principal, this is probably fresh on your mind. If you're an elementary type person, this may be a tough question for you. But at some point in time, if you're a secondary teacher, a kid walks up to you or a parent contacts you and says, what can I do to raise my grade? Okay. What I'd like you to do right now is turn to a person next to you. And what would your response be? Go ahead, 30 seconds. Go ahead. Some of you, I heard, say something like, oh, they can redo a test, perhaps. Some of you said, well, check PowerSchool or JMC or Infinite Campus and find out the homework you haven't turned in yet and turn that in. Some of you said, you know, um, you haven't turned in an entire project yet. Do that. Some of you are thinking, well, Halloween's coming up soon. I'll just offer you a Halloween crossword puzzle. Maybe no one said that. <laughs> Hopefully not. But that happens, right? Oh, by the way, let's give kids a bunch of C-level busy work to help them raise their grade from a B- minus to a B. Isn't that kind of what we're saying? It's interesting, the, the things, though, that we do in the moment. Again, this is no blame, no shame. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I really feel for that kid, so I'm going to invent an extra opportunity for that kid so they get their grade up. Or sometimes I'm afraid of that parent. I'm like, I just want to please that parent, so I'm going to kind of bend my own rules so that the kid can get the grade they want to. Or if this kid does not get their grade up from an F, the football coach is going to be on my back because the kid's going to be eligible. There's all these scenarios that we deal with. Or even as elementary, sometimes there's pressure there for our kids to have good marks. I call it the bumper sticker syndrome, right? Every parent wants the bumper sticker that says, my kid is in National Honor Society, or on the honor roll, or whatever it might be, to really show their kids doing well. Because we want the best for our families. We want the best for our kids. I want to share with you a little bit of research on grading. Um, there has been a lot of research on grading, actually, but specifically, um, there was a study done where two papers were sent to 200 English teachers, and 143 teachers actually responded, and they scored both of the papers. So that was two of the exact same papers, 143 people scored them. Okay? On paper one, the scores ranged from 64 to 98%. Wow. On paper two, the scores ranged from 50 to 97%. By the way, who's the English teachers in here? Couple? Okay. Where's the math teachers and science teachers at? Yeah, you're, we're laughing right now at, this, at the English people because that English is so subjective. Like, what's a good poem anyways, right? Like, what's a good paper? Okay. Well, here's the funny story is that when this study was done, that's what people were saying. Like, oh, English is so subjective, you know? We need to figure out a way to make it more objective. And so what they did is, later on, they did a follow-up study, and they said, let's train everyone how to score these things using a traits of writing exercise, okay? And so they did a follow-up study. The paper was sent to 90 English teachers after they attended it, 73 returned them, and the paper scores still range from 50 to 96%. Again, the math and science people in here are like kind of laughing right now at those English folks, but the last laugh is about to happen, okay? You see, I didn't tell you when this study took place, you might have seen right here that that study took place in 2011. I'd we'll like to tell you about a study that took place in 1913 that followed up the study that took place in 1912. And by the way, you can look these up. I've got the PDFs if you'd like to read the whole study yourself. 1913, the same folks that did this study thought, well, we better try it out with math. So they sent out 128 math 
ta uh, geometry tasks to math teachers, and the scores range from 28 to 95 percent. But math, there's always the right answer. Math teachers would tell you this things like labels, and did you show your work, and what was your work like, and all those types of things. What the heck? And so there's always been this subject to this weird thing about grading. That you can take a kid in this class and a kid in another class, they're both in biology, taught by different teachers, sometimes even taught by the exact same teacher, do the exact same work and they get different grades because of the fogginess related to grading. I want to share with you a, a very sad story about my own experience as a teacher. I shared with you that I was a math teacher. I also taught some computer applications courses for a couple years. And here I was, my very first year teaching. Um, I was teaching this computer applications class. Here are all these computer labs right here in front of me. And um, just computers and a printer, right here, a printer. And so I'm thinking to myself, what happens when the paper runs out in the printer? So I turn around and there's some cupboards. I open it up and there's some reams of paper. But I thought to myself, what's going to happen when the reams of paper are all gone? And believe it or not, I was a really shy first year teacher. And I thought to myself, I'm I just don't really want to go ask the principal about this because I'm not really sure. So I've got a solution. Class! If you bring your real paper by next Friday, I will give you 10 points of extra credit. Fix my problem? Why wouldn't you want to do that? It helps you in your grade. Here's what I was really telling you. As a family, as a student, if your family has the means to buy a real paper, you will arbitrarily get a better grade in this class when compared to your peers who don't otherwise have the means. And by the way, even if your parents do have the means, this stuff have the time to take you to Target or Staples or Walmart. Oh, and by the way, if your family, if your parents have to work three jobs just to put food on the table, too bad. Too bad. That's what I was telling these kids and these families. How sad was that? How sad was that? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do something kind of silly in a while just to try to help us all take what I call the no more materials for extra credit pledge. So please stand up. Please stand up. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. Matt. Matt. And all the parents of my school district. And all the parents of my school district. From this day forward. From this day forward. I will never award extra credit. I will never award extra credit. For materials. For materials. Because it's an equity issue. Because it's and I will do everything under my power, to make sure my colleagues at home know this as well. All right, thanks. I've seen silly, but here's the here's the here, here's what happens, folks. This thing happens across Iowa. Would you agree? This thing happens across America. It is sad. If you don't give a rip about anything else I say, anything else that takes place here in the session. Quit giving extra credit for materials. It is an equity issue that we can stop tomorrow without the permission of our principal, superintendent, or school board. All right, moving on to more important things. Here's things, though, that also do happen that I think we can also fix. So John Doe, you know, John Doe's in your class. You just got done with the quiz, and so you grade the quiz and put that score in Power School or Internet Campus or JMC or whatever and uh, maybe canvas, and you hand it back to the kid, and you hope that the kid, like, looks at that and is like, oh my gosh, 14 out of 16. I wonder what I need to do to get 16 out of 16 next time. Right? But here's what happens. Some kids are like, oh, 14 out of 16, 14 divided by 16. Maybe I have to help them with this. And they're like, oh, 14 out of 16 is some percent. Okay, that grade's okay. I think I'll just be all right with that. We do a good job on there, so they're thinking it's a good job. <laughs> but we really want them to get better. And by the way, we put 14 out of 16 in the grade book in Power School and Campus. Do the parents see the mistakes that the kids made? Maybe if the kid took the paper home, but they probably it's probably in the bottom of their locker or in the recycle bin. So they have no idea if the kid made a few small mistakes, made a big mistake. All they see is 14 out of 16, and they have no idea. Oh, by the way, once upon a time, there wasn't like these electronic grade books, right? Like back when I was in high school, there was no electronic grade books. And so we really had no idea what our grades were until unless we asked our teacher and they told us like, oh, you're at an A right now. Okay, sounds good. 
But then with the invention of electronic grade books, we think that we have to enter things in there all the time because that's what our parents and students expect of us. And so that's what got us into this 14 out of 16 issue. And so, oh, hold on, Matt. We do project-based learning in our school. We don't do those tests and quizzes things. Well, let me tell you about a rubric because we were talking about rubrics earlier. Here's a rubric that I used in my statistics class. Um, you can't really read it that well, but here's the bottom line. This thing up in here is basically how well did the kid organize the data. This thing right here is like how well they organize like the big picture project. This one right here is worth five points. This one right here was five times two, so 10 plus five is 15. 15, the whole thing was worth 25 because that's 10 more right there. A kid could know absolutely nothing about the math and they got a 15 out of 25 on this project, all right? We do that sometimes. There's so much emphasis on the process, and I think there is a time to look at the process, but the teachers at the next level are expecting that when we give passing grades or A's or B's or C's or whatever, that they mean the kids know something about the content area. So, um, another chance for you all to weigh in. Um, Bob, Ace the homework, ace the quiz, ace the test in your class. Susie got a 75% on the homework, 80% on the quiz, 100% on the test. I want you to think right now, in your class today, this semester, this trimester, who gets a better grade in your class? And which student knows more? I want you to just think for just a second. We're going to do an all-room opportunity to participate. Okay. Go ahead and discuss right now. We're going to take an all room poll here in just a second. So again, uh, 30 seconds, just answer those real quick. Go ahead. All right, let's take a look at the first question. First question. The possibilities in your current class, who gets a better grade? Raise your hand if you said Bob gets a better grade. Raise your hand. Okay. Raise your hand if you think Susie gets a better grade in your class right now. Okay. Raise your hand if they get the same grade in your class right now. And raise your hand if you haven't voted yet. All right, that's an old high school math trick, because now, since I asked if you hadn't voted, you voted that you, okay, never mind. All right. All right, now, which student knows more? Raise your hand if you think Bob knows more. Susie knows more? A few people? They know the same. Almost everyone rose their hand, raised their hand and said that they know the same. Interesting, though, is that not everyone raised their hand and said that they get the same grade in our class. Some of you said that, but not all of you. Agree or disagree? Students learn at different rates and different paces. Everyone agrees. I've asked this question to literally thousands of educators, and every single person agrees with the statement. Okay? Um, why is it then that when we go to things like uh, driver's license tests, uh, we go to the driver's license test, and it says, uh, sorry, Mr. Johnson, your second driver's license test was excellent, but we have to average it with the one you took from August. You'll have a C written in the driver's license issue today. You see, we do that in our classrooms. Well, you can retake this test only, but it'll only be worth half credit. Or you can do, redo these questions only at 75% or something like that. When deep down we know that kids learn at different rates and different paces. Uh, here's another example, the JoJo's of the world. Last Friday, JoJo failed the test, and then JoJo walks up to you and says, oh, Mr. Townsley, I think I get it now. I think I understand it. And you say, in the traditional paradigm, sorry, JoJo, you haven't learned it by the arbitrary test deadline I set, which was last Friday. Too bad. Or, yeah, you can do it, but it's only worth partial credit. But deep down, we know that kids do learn at different rates and different paces. And so I think that what we're starting to see here is that sometimes our beliefs don't always match up with our practices. 
Okay? So I talked a lot about some identifiable weaknesses with our current grading practices. During the last 20 minutes or so here, I want to share with you what this idea of standards-based grading is, what's it look like in a classroom, and if we have time, you have questions as well. So first, at our school district, we have established a number of grading guidelines. So all of our teachers have to abide by these grading guidelines. Uh, we don't leave it up to chance. The first one is that entries in the grade book that count towards the final grade are limited to course or grade level standards. So instead of seeing biology test A, that biology test is broken down into like the five or six different standards. And some of you are thinking, that's what we do in elementary. Yeah, this is what we do in elementary, and now we do it in secondary as well. So that parents and students can see their relative strengths and weaknesses relative to the standards. Um, we've gone so far as to eliminate extra credit. I mean, there's no materials, obviously, for extra credit, but there's no crossword puzzles. There's no come and do this at night and get some extra credit type thing. There's just none of that because we believe that um, it's not what grades are all about. The third thing is that students are allowed multiple opportunities to demonstrate their understanding in various ways. Okay? It doesn't have to be doing it the exact same way the first time. Here's an example, when I taught high school math, we were teaching this thing called the triangle inequality. And I actually had a student teacher at the time. And um, this kid didn't do very well on the geometry test for, uh, for, for the triangle inequality. And my student teacher said, well, I think this kid really does know. So what we agreed on is that this kid went home. And we said, hey, kid, go home. You have three straws at home or three toothpicks? Yeah. OK, I want you to explain this concept to as many people in your family as possible this weekend. Your grandma, if you can find her, your grandpa, your mom, your dad, your sister, your brother. I want you to come back Monday morning and then verbally explain it to us. And you know what? I am confident that kid to this day probably remembers the triangle inequality. We didn't say, oh, thank you for doing that. Now could you go and do these test problems for us? It was very clear that the kid knew this triangle inequality thing. So we erased the number for that standard in the grade book, and we wrote over it in the grade book. We, we joke and say, you know what, if you're out and like eating fast food, you know, and you see a kid there, they could hypothetically do a reassessment on a napkin if they wanted to, right there at Hardee's or McDonald's. That's okay. That's really what we want our, our, our teachers to do. Um, teachers will determine gradebook entries by considering multiple points of data. So it's not as if there was a three in the gradebook before and now a four now, and we automatically average those two together. We want them to emphasize the most recent one, because we believe that kids do learn at different rates and different paces. And so if you get it at the end of the semester, that's just as good as getting it at the beginning of the semester. And then we also have a statement about uh, homework. We believe that homework is really practice. And um, we want kids to be able to practice and practice and practice without penalty. And so practice, while you might see it in the grade book, does not count towards the final grade. So we're going to skip this video, but if you're interested, we have like a five minute video that's posted on our website through YouTube. You can check it out. It's a video that we've shown to our community, to our um, to outsiders that come visit our school as well. So first thing that a lot of our teachers do is they used to say you had to wait 24 hours to find out how we do on the homework. Now, most of our teachers post the actual homework answers on the board, or they post them on their website so that kids can access them on the, on, on, from their computer, the library, at home, wherever it is. Um, kids get a lot quicker feedback that way. And it's, doesn't count towards the final grade. And I don't know about you, but when I was a high school teacher, I got sick and tired of like walking through the hallways at 7.55 in the morning, and there there were with kids copying their homework. This happens sometimes even in elementary, believe it or not, too, because they feel like there's this pressure to do well in their homework, but it's really just practice. And believe it or not, kids actually do start checking their answers. That's just visual proof there. <coughs> so then once the homework is returned, some of our teachers will put like a red, yellow, green on it. I'm sorry, the, the students will, before they turn in, put red, yellow, green. Red means I still have no idea what I'm doing. Yellow means I kind of get this stuff, but I still have a question. And green means awesome, I get it. Do you think that if a kid writes yellow, question 15 on it, and hands it in, and then the teacher takes the time to write a, a written response on number 15, do you think the kid's more likely to look at that when they get it back? We found that, yeah, they are more likely to look at their homework, as opposed to just saying, oh, here it is, throw up recycle bin. And so this is a way that you can, if you don't transition to standards-based grading, you can do this practice alone later this week in your classroom. Uh, there's just an example of a kid that wrote yellow, and I wrote some comments back to that kid. Um, quizzes then, in my math classroom, not all of our teachers do it this way, but um, uh, we, we write the standards over here. So this is like the quiz, then like on the back of the quiz, like on a piece of paper. 
this says that um, this was the standard. This is the problem numbers that are related to that standard. So the standard problem numbers are related to it. Before a kid turns in their quiz then, in pencil, they circle where they think they're at along that continuum, right? So, oh, on those problems, I think I'm almost there. On those problems, I still need some help, okay? Then what I would do after they turned them in to me is I would circle where I think they're at on that same continuum. And then I would hand them back to the class strategically, okay? So I would pick out two kids, one kid who really rocked this one right here and didn't do so well on this one, and match him up with the kid who really rocked it on this one and didn't do so well on this one. Say, so, hey, Frank, Susie, you get together and talk about the quiz. Not that there's going to be some type of magic that happens there, but they're more likely to listen to a peer talk about it than they are me saying, all right, class, who has questions on the quiz? And the smartest kid raises their hand. They're like, I want to do number five. You do number five while the rest of the class is sleeping. And then the smartest kid is like, oh, okay, I figured I made a mistake on the very last line. What I do during that time is I strategically move around the room and just find out who needs help. It doesn't take more than a couple minutes to do that. And then after they've had a chance to talk to each other, all right, who has questions now on the quiz? Okay. Um, what we do, though, at some point in time is we do have to put um, things in the grade book. And so we use a 1, 2, 3, 3.5, 4 scale. There's not a specific reason that we use 1, 2, 3, 3.5, 4 other than that's what our teacher has decided upon once upon a time. It's not perfect. It's definitely not perfect at all, but that's what our teacher has decided upon. So what happens is, is on a test or a project or a speech or whatever, the teacher says, I look at this standard. Which narrative best describes what the kid's current level of understanding is for that specific standard, okay? So it's matching their work with a narrative, okay? And then that number goes in the grade book, okay? So here is a standard. I took off the kids' names, obviously. So here were, here's the standard. Here's how well all the kids in the class done that standard, okay? And so chapter three, this whole thing right here would have just been one score in the grade book once upon a time. In a standards-based system, it was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight indicators in the grade book. Homework, you'll see, is over there. It's zero weighted in the grade book. Some of our teachers now, instead of putting a number in there, the number was just the number of assignments that the kids turned in in this example. We're, we've now kind of morphed into individually putting them in there and doing like a little check mark in our power school that says it's been collected. Um, it's just a way of still communicating to parents because we want the parents to know is the reason that your kid not is the reason that your kids are not doing very well is because they're not putting forth the effort. In other words, they haven't turned in the homework, or is it because they've turned in the homework and they still don't get it? And so that's why we believe it's still important to put the homework in the grade book. We do also still convert to letter grades. There's not a perfect way to do this, but this happens to be the sole example how we do it because it plays nicely in Power School. If there are ten standards. And we use our four-point scale. Let's say James had all fours except for a three. So that's uh, 39 out of 40 standard points. 97.5% is an A. That system, our parents seem to understand it. It plays nicely with PowerSchool and do the same for Campus or JMC. It does have its flaws, though, because if this was a one right here, this kid would still be at an A. And some of our teachers are like, what the heck? A kid is getting an A in my class, and they know jack crap about one of the standards. It doesn't seem to make sense. And so one of our teachers is doing something kind of like this, like a, a piecewise logic function type thing. In order to get an A, you have to have all fours, except you can have up to five, 50% of them, be a 3.5. And they just kind of create these formulas along the way. And the analogy there is, you know, if you're buying a car, and the car, like on a Carfax report, says something like, oh, this car has really great tires, awesome, it's clean on the outside, <clears throat> it runs really fast, but the transmission is crap. Do you really want to buy that car? If you average all those together, no way. You wouldn't do that. And so her whole thing is, is I want to try to communicate very specific to you, and I want to make sure that you are working towards um, improving upon your weaknesses. The reason that we haven't scaled this is because this is harder for our parents to understand and because our grade book just does not do that. She teaches business, and so she actually teaches kids how to keep track of their own using an Excel document with like count ifs and all that crazy fun stuff. 
Um, when students reassess, uh, sometimes it's, do they blindly reassess? Well, they don't blindly reassess. It's not as if, well, you didn't do very well on the test today, you can do it tomorrow. We actually make sure, first of all, that the kid has done their practice, their homework. If a kid has not done their homework or their practice to begin with, because that will happen, by the way, because that's not, this is not the final grade, so like, I'm just going to not do it anymore. The first thing our teachers are going to do is they're going to go back and see, did the kid do the practice that was related to that specific standard? If they did, that's the first thing they have to do. If they have, and sometimes even if they haven't, all of our teachers have some type of insurance policy that says you must complete the homework or practice related to that standard, plus you have to do something else. Not because they're mean, nasty teachers, but because they want to help them do something to close the learning gap. Okay? So our biology teacher says that um, they have to do all these things. Uh, let's see. They need to complete their science notebook. So it's a way for them to make sure they've done all the things that they're supposed to do. Um, once the requirements are met, students may reassess. This cannot be on the same day they received help from me. So trying to create this atmosphere where it's not just cramming. And that reassessments are only available on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, some of our teachers actually require a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session before they can reassess. Some of them say you have to go home and do all these problems and come back and explain them to me. Some of our teachers say you have to journal about it. And these are all kinds of different things they do so that kids have some skin in the game. If you start this in your classroom, I guarantee the kids will try to game the system. They will stop doing their homework. And so Amy's shaking her head. She's seeing this in her classroom. They will game it. And eventually, most kids will figure out, man, I should probably just do it right the first time. Not all kids, but most kids. Um, we, again, we encourage all of our teachers to have some type of reassessment policy or schedule, when to do it, what are all, all those different types of stuff. Some common questions about all this. What does our high school transcript look like? Some schools that are doing this at the secondary level, they put all the standards on the transcript and then the letter grade. We don't do that. We just have a letter grade on there. We just convert the standards to the letter grade. So basically, our transcript looked exact, it looks exactly the same in 2015 as it did in 1995. A for biology, all that stuff. Middle school, we still convert to letter grades as well. I wish that we didn't, but that's just kind of where we're at right now. If I were to do it over again, we would eliminate letter grades in middle school, and it would just be a strictly a standards-based piece, just like it is in our elementary school. Do students move on once they master a standard? In our system, no. Um, we're still moving kids along at the, kind of these cohort paces. We're not saying, oh, you get this standard today, you're on an individual level moving on to the next standard while the rest of the kids are doing this one before. We're not there yet. How does this prepare students for college? My analogy there is, um, all right, let's, let's really do prepare kids for college. I hear in college at the University of Iowa, how many of you go to the University of Iowa, by the way? Iowa State, the Iowa Staters in here? Okay, I hear in Iowa State and Iowa that you could like be in a lecture hall with 200 or 400 other students, is that true? Okay, great idea. Let's start doing that in high school. Let's put all the sophomores at Solon in the gym and let's lecture to all 120 of them at the exact same time for biology. Who thinks that's a great way of educating kids? It's not a great way of educating kids. It's a, it's a way of doing it in masses, but it's a really poor way of educating kids. But we might do that in the spirit of getting kids ready for college. Or let's just start creating dormitories for high schools because we have to get them ready for dormitory life in college. Or, you know what I hear, that um, they have night classes in some colleges. We should start requiring night classes in the event that our kids have night classes in college. So they can get used to learning at 7 o'clock at night. We don't do any of those things because some of them we think are bad practices, other of them just don't make sense. And so the idea here is, is we're going to do things well in K-12 because we think they're the right thing to do. Not just because college does or does not do that. What's the role of homework? It really is practice. It does not count towards the final grade. We still do homework. Um, if we had more time, we could envision what this looks like in a digital classroom. I really think that a lot of these principles are the same. Whether you're um, having kids create digital products, um, whether you're one-on-one, one-on-one, or -one, one -on -one, maybe you even have Google Classroom. If you have an assignment that you're using in Google Classroom that you're assessing, instead of putting the entire assignment in your gradebook, you'd think to yourself, what was the standard I was really trying to assess there? And put that in the gradebook instead. You might be thinking, is this just a solid thing? Are they just crazy and solid? Um, 
there are a number of other schools that are really getting after this. Um, our school district has worked with Center Point Urbana quite a bit. Uh, West Branch is another school that's not up there that is really getting after this. Clear Creek Manor Middle School uh, has spent a lot of time in this area. Oskaloosa is trying to work towards that. Uh, Van Meter School District, Waukee Middle School. Uh, we had a lot of participants come to the Scanners Base Grading Conference in 2013. You can see all the schools that were interested in this idea. We had another conference in 2015. If you're interested, Grantwood AEA is having another standards based grading conference in 2016. You can email me, I can hook you up with the person organizing that. Um, but actually, the biggest school district in Iowa, the Des Moines Public School District, um, some of you know, is getting after this idea um, of this idea of standards based grading. They're slowly bringing it up through the high school ranks. Uh, and so it's something that I believe is really catching on in Iowa. Um, over in the state of Oregon a couple of years ago, um, Starting this term in 2013, every public school student in Oregon is supposed to be graded solely by whether they have mastered the academic skills covered in class. Isn't that interesting? And so I really believe this is something um, that's not just a solo thing, not just an Iowa thing, that's really starting to uh, catch some steam across the country. Um, I'm going to leave you with a really great resource, um, www.sbgvideos.org. Maybe you want to take this information back to your colleagues. You can go on this site. And you can see a five minute video on what this standards based grading thing looks like in a science classroom or a language arts classroom. All it is is it's a five minute voiceover. If you click on where it says discipline specific there, you will see videos created by Iowa practitioners doing a five minute voiceover of what this looks like in the classroom with their email address at the very end. You can email them and say, hey, I saw your video on svgvideos.org. Could you send me some more information though? Could we Skype sometime where that looks like? All of these videos were created as part of those standards based grading conferences I shared through earlier. Um, tinyurl.com slash SVG literature. As I find more information about standards based grading, I just add it there. Um, so if you want to know what's like the research base behind this or want to read more about the theory, you can check that out. A couple books, if you're a Twitter type person, SVL chat on Wednesdays is a, a popular opportunity or a popular time where you can learn more about that in social media. Um, this has been a process for our school district. It really started out back in 2009. Um, I was getting after as a classroom teacher. Uh, eventually we got our Board of Education involved. If you want to read more about it, we had an article that was published in Ed Leadership that you could read more about the entire process. Um, I'd also be happy to share with you more about it if your system's at the place where you're trying to scale this from a few teachers to many. Um, we are really close out of time. If you have some questions, um, I'd love to stick around and answer those for you. Thanks for um, picking this session this afternoon to learn more about grading. I hope you can at least take away one thing, and that's to get rid of those stinking extra credit opportunities for kids and things like whiteboard markers and grades boxes. Thanks for coming today. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of the day.